5.30. Okay. Are we live, Charles? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, terrific. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Brooke Moore. I'm the vice chair of the Nantucket Select Board. And um, joining us this evening on the panel for this session, informational session on the uh, short-term rental related art articles that are, will be um, uh, discussed and voted on at a special town meeting on November 7th are John Giorgio from town council's office and Jim Salter, who is a member and is um, representing the, the former members of this uh, short-term rental work group as um, who's gonna walk through the frequently asked questions with us this evening. Um, as a point of clarification and purpose of this meeting, we are not going to begin the town meeting debate um, by Zoom. We are gonna focus on technical aspects in two areas. The first being um, town meeting process, warrant process, et cetera. Um, and then the second being the actual uh, regulations and zoning bylaw changes that are proposed in the warrant articles and how they might impact um, people's individual situations. And this is really designed to be an opportunity for people to ask questions so they better understand what the processes are and uh, what the impact of these warrant articles will be before we head into town meeting on November 7th. So um, I'm going to um, start by asking Jim Salter to review um, the purposes and intent as outlined in the warrant article and drafted by the short-term rental work group. And Erica, if you wouldn't mind sharing um, so people can follow along with the printed material. Okay. And Erica, it looks like it's in edit mode with the paragraphs. If you could change that, that would be great. Oh, well, we want to go back to the, town, to the town warrant, to the purpose and intent. If we can. It's page 11, maybe. Bear with us. Is that you good, Erica, finding that? Sorry, you want me to go into the actual warrant? Um, if... If that makes sense, if it's easy to get to page 11 of the actual warrant, that would yep. be great. If not, I can talk through it. Oh, just that. give me one, one moment. Sorry, I didn't have that up. Thank you. No problem. And so while Eric is doing that, I'll, I'll say that the purpose and intent is a little prelude at the beginning of the warrant. It's really about the values that, that uh, guided the short-term rental group as we were coming up with regulations that we thought would chart a, a reasonable uh, middle course that would protect property rights, yet also protect uh, the uh, integrity of neighborhoods. Sorry, I'm just looking. Okay, I guess we have to go back. Um, just keep going back to the purpose and intent. It would just be in, there it is. Okay, and we'll, number one is about registration. We'll start with number two. One of, our, uh, one of our values, one of our intents was to protect the time-honored tradition of home rentals on Nantucket and preserve economic opportunities through short-term rentals, STRs, for persons to keep their homes. We know there's a long tradition of people renting out homes. We wanted to not only uh, show respect for that, but allow people who are using STRs uh, to keep their homes to do so. Um, Along with that came, we want to avoid adverse impacts on the local economy, stemming from a loss of existing STR revenue. And that also includes uh, tax revenue that the town receives. We wanted to make sure that we uh, protected that income in a reasonable way. So those first two we mentioned are about protecting rights, protecting income. The next three are about trying to reduce the uh, perhaps harmful, perhaps unwanted um, effects of STRs. And the, the and that's number four is prohibit additional corporate ownership and discourage investment only ownership of residential properties for the exclusive purpose of operating them as STRs. Um, we have we are putting in regulations to prohibit corporate ownership moving forward. And also we have some regulations in effect that we think will do a good job of discouraging investment only STRs. We've all seen those STRs, and I know many of us uh, 
really would hope to see them uh, winnow down. Next, uh, if we can, to reduce neighborhood churn caused by numerous turnovers. We have a few regulations uh, dealing with that, which I'll get into. And um, finally, in this reducing the possible harm of SDRs is to try to limit the conversion of residential units to short-term rentals, which has had the deleterious effect of removing residential units from the available year-round stock. Uh, again, this, this is mainly, we try to do this through two regulations that will discourage that will discourage investment only STRs. Okay, now how do we how do we do this? We have um, or how do we try to do this? So these are these are important values that we, all of us on the group shared, and I think probably most people in the community share. There's a balance there. So if we could go, Erica, please to the uh, FAQs. Uh, we'll start with town meeting process. Thank you. At the very top of that. Okay, Jim, so I'm gonna. I'm going to interrupt just a second to say yeah. welcome Denise Cronow, who's representing the Finance Committee on our panel tonight. Sorry for the I interruption. Did. Thank you. Okay, so let's go through the FAQs, and we're starting with town meeting, the process, and basically the first question, what are the benefits if only the general bylaw passes at the town meeting? And this is just an overview. If the general bylaw passes, a beneficial balance will be established between allowing existing STRs to continue and moderating future growth. Okay, so that's the balance we're trying to get. Here are some key points, which we'll get into in more detail. All existing STRs will be protected. Corporate ownership of new STRs will be banned. For new STRs, there will be a limit of one, one per person and a maximum of four changes of occupancy will allow be allowed in high season. And the reason for that is to try to avoid um, investment only STRs, people buying up homes and renting them out all summer. This will limit that. Now, I want to um, discuss a term I just used, protected. Um, we on the uh, STR work group, we're in a constant state of learning about STRs, about regulations, about law issues, also, and about each other working together. One piece of learning happened just today. There was a, a very compelling letter in the INM by Lee Sopperstein. And I want to thank you, Lee, for pointing out the truly horrid origins of the term grandfathering, which I and I think all of us didn't know. We thought it was just a zoning term. Now, um, we had that term does not does not appear in the warrant at all, but it did appear in the STRs that we for in the STR FAQs that we first wrote up. Um, but for tonight, I have replaced that term with either protected or uh, protected pre-existing non-conforming, and, and you'll see where they are. Basically, what it means is a status that existed before continues to be allowed to exist despite changes of the law underneath that, and um, so. Uh, we had no idea that language was so insensitive, grandfathering, but now we are making the change, and thank you, Lee, for that. All right, so now let's go on to what are the additional benefits if the zoning bylaw also passes at town meeting. Now, that's Article 2. If the zoning bylaw also passes the legality of STRs on Nantucket, which is already recognized and accepted by the town, that will be further confirmed. And we believe lawsuits against STR owners will be ended. Now, as it currently stands in the FinCom version, the two articles are linked in both directions. That simply means both articles must pass in order for either to go into effect. Okay, so let's go on to what are the main features of Article 1, which is the general bylaw. First, a simple math question, what voting total in percent does, do the general bylaws need to pass? They need a 50% or greater. Um, I guess one more vote than 50%. Um, okay, now the next question. I've heard that the general bylaw features a pre-existing non-conforming protection clause for current homeowners. What properties and or STRs are protected? Okay, this is what we used to call grandfathering. I won't use that term again tonight. Okay, what is protected? A property with a structure will be protected for the purposes of STR renting if the owner can submit proof that the structure has been issued a certificate of occupancy prior to November 7th, 2023, town meeting, special town meeting. But after that date, a property that is sold is no longer protected 
and new structures after that date also are not protected. Okay, so what does it mean if your property is protected as an STR? What does that mean about how you can rent it? And here the basic value was we wanted to protect the ongoing process of people, of families who already owned STRs and not do anything that would hurt the family finances that are already existing. So if your property is protected, the status of being protected confers the following. As many as nine changes of occupancy in high season, that's July and August, an owner may operate multiple STRs if all the properties are protected, and a corporation may continue to operate an STR if that property is protected. We found uh, because of the legal uh, term of retroactivity, we could not stop. If we were allowing others to, to be protected, we could not unprotect past corporate ownership, but we do hope to change that moving forward as I'll get to in a second. Okay, let's say your property is not protected as an STR. What does that mean about how you can rent it? Instead of nine changes of occupancy in high season, as many as four changes of occupancy in high season. And again, that's trying to prevent uh, potential investors in investment only STRs from buying up homes that could be with year round people, from buying up those homes and turning them into STRs. We think with only four contracts allowed in high summer, they will have uh, less chance of making it a successful investment and will be less likely to purchase it. Okay, what else if you're not protected? An owner may operate no more than one STR per owner. Again, that's another sort of bulwark to try to limit. And no corporations may operate an STR. Uh, all right, now, I've heard there are limits on the number of contracts allowed. Okay, so the, the limits are basically what I mentioned in July and August, whether you're protected or not protected. There are no limits on the number of contracts allowed outside of high season. We did that because we feel that um, from what we've experienced, the churn, the overcrowding is not the same in October, let's say, as it is in July 15th. And so it, it would allow people who need to rent their STRs to do so. Okay, now, what happens if you have a protected STR property and you sell it? Well, uh, then it's no longer protected. It can only have four changes of occupancy in high season. And that owner, of course, can only operate one STRs. Now, here's a question. What properties are not covered or affected by the general bylaws? And we designated two because we felt that they were special conditions. And those are called hosted stays and cottage colonies. They can operate as before. Um, without any limits. And I'll just read you the definition of what a hosted stay is. It's actually in the warrant. A hosted stay, basically, it's where the owner is living there and allows people to come in. And we know that in those cases, the owners want everyone to be quiet and well-behaved, and there's usually no problems with any neighbors. But a hosted stay, quote, an overnight stay whereby a short-term renter occupies a portion of a dwelling unit where the owner is present. An owner is considered present when the owner is on the premises except during the daytime and or work hours. In other words, the owner gets to work, okay. And then what's a cottage colony? Well, we've all seen those little cottages uh, around the island that are rented uh, seasonally. We didn't want to affect their business in any way. Cottage colony, according to the definition, is a group of four or more detached dwellings legally in existence at the time of adoption of this bylaw, located on a single lot, which is customarily occupied on a seasonal basis. So that those two hostess stay cottage colleges, cottages not affected by uh, this property, by these regulations of, of their property. Now, um, let's go on to the next one. How many properties can I rent as an STR if my properties are protected and if they're not? This is a little redundant, I guess, but if all your STR properties are, quote, protected, you may continue to operate them all moving forward. If they're not protected, one per owner. Now, the question of corporations. Can corporations own and operate an STR? Only if the STR property qualifies to be protected. Moving forward, corporations are not allowed to operate new STRs. Now, we use the language for that, first of all, from Palm Springs, California. They, they uh, prohibited corporations a number of years ago, and they said they've had quite su good success with it. But also Great Barrington, Massachusetts, came up with some language about the, the uh, 
uh, that you that we will get to later that has to do with that and has been approved by the attorney general. So we'll get to that. So we've we tried to use language with John Giorgio's help along the way always of uh, language that will pass the legal test. One of those legal terms is the term natural person, which is mentioned in the general bylaw. Why did we use that term? What does it mean? And really, a natural person is simply a legal term that means a real human being. Why do we use that? Well, because we have the issue of can a property owned by an LLC or trust or S Corp operate an STR? And the answer is yes, but only when every shareholder, partner, or member of the legal entity is a natural person, as established by documentation provided by the applicant at the time of registration. This language came to us from Great Barrington, and basically it's saying, yes, an LLC can own an STR. However, it needs to prove that it relates to natural, natural persons. Okay. Finally, uh, sort of off to the side, are STRs allowed in a deed-restricted unit or an apartment or townhouse? And the basic answer is only if they're protected. Um, they meet the qualifications for being, quote, protected. STRs may not be operated in any deed-restricted unit or in an unrestricted unit in an apartment building or a townhouse owned or operated and managed as rental housing, unless they're protected. Now that's sort of the general outline of the general bylaws. Those are the regulations that, that show uh, how STRs will be regulated over time. The article two is about zoning. And Jim, I'm going to yes. interrupt you and invite the audience to raise raise your uh, digital hand if you have any uh -huh. questions about Article One, and we'll give Jim a break here for a second. Um, please don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, and I'm going to um, Campbell Sutton has her hand up. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you. I do have a couple of questions. Do I just do one or can I ask them all? Why don't you ask them one at a time? If they're not directly related, we can answer them one at a time. So for the record, it's asked and answered, asked and answered. Okay, super. Thank you. So in section F, it, it mentions um, getting an, uh, for renewing, a renewal application shall include an attestation that the short-term rental was operated in accordance with bylaws, et cetera. Where do you get that? Like how, how do you get that? Is that the same as where they do it further up where you prove you've paid your taxes and everything, or is this a separate? Um, so Campbell, uh, go ahead, John. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Campbell, there'll be a, a space on the application form for the uh, applicant to, to attest, that means under the pains and penalties of perjury, that they have operated their short-term rental in accordance with all bylaws and regulations of the town. It'll basically oh, oh. be a sign off on the application. Oh, super. So by signing the application, you're attesting to? Yes. Okay, awesome, thanks. Um, so in I, it says, um, it mentions a property management company and describes their ability to do the short-term renting, I think it is. Um, was it I? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. So what I was wondering is, is this property management company, would that fall under operator in the definitions? Or is that are those two separate things? There are two separate things, Campbell. The, the operator is the person that either owns or is responsible for operating the short-term rental. Um, but if you have a, um, uh, if you list your property, with one of the hosting platforms, for example, then that's a prop property management company. And you can also hire a company to do the cleaning and the setup and so forth. Um, but what we're getting at here is um, any individual 
or other legal entity can only operate one short-term rental. Correct. So then, okay, so then that brings up, if you use real estate offices versus the, um, the, the online platforms, does that fall under somewhere? <laughs> under this yeah it would be indistinguishable for purposes of subsection i whether it's a hosting platform or a local real estate agent that you know they would you can hire someone to provide that service but as the operator of the you are the operator of that unit you can hire a hosting platform or um a real estate agent okay so they they would be uh, consider the same thing and yes. okay I know I have another question about that but I can't think of it right now then I don't know if I can ask this because it's about the article like at the end the effective date is struck through and I was just wondering what what that was why that was uh, yes, so that language appears in the, um, excuse me, one moment, please. Early on on the call, sorry about that. Um, that was in the original um, bylaw that was voted on at the now um, the 2022 annual town meeting. Um, we had put in there an effective date further into the future. Uh, but we're taking that out of the bylaw now, which means that this bylaw, putting aside the linkage issue, will become effective upon approval by the attorney general and publication of the bylaw by the town clerk. Okay, but all the um, all of the deadline things that you mentioned throughout this article of the town meeting November seventh still hold. It's yes, correct. So, yes. so it's just okay. I I understand what you're saying. Okay, so it it doesn't change the um, outcome here. No, it does not. Thank okay, you, Campbell. I think those were. I had a question on Article Two, but I think that comes up next. Correct. That that will we're, we're sticking to Article One at the moment. Thanks. Okay, super. I'm thank gonna, yep. I'm going to call Ron Cocott. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, uh, hi, I uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. I uh, I asked this question previously at, uh, believe it was a select board, although it might have been a FinCon meeting, regarding uh, Section F that the previous uh, questioner uh, mentioned. And uh, at that time, Mr. Uh, my question was, uh, I have to attest that I operated, and the, the, the word that I'm concerned about is operated in accordance with all bylaws and regulations of town during the previous year. And my question was, if an owner for some reason, a protected owner for some reason takes a hiatus for a year and does not short-term rent his property, does that statement say that he loses his protected status? And Mr. Giorgio had said, that's not the intention. But as I read it, I keep questioning it in my mind. And then what I just heard you say, that it must have been operated during the previous year. And, and I'm not sure the definition of operated, because if I didn't rent to anyone, did I operate? No, it's not whether you operate, it, it doesn't require that you operate the short-term rental in the previous year. You can take a year off, you can take two years off. Remember that you need to renew your, your certificate of registration every year. 
what this is saying is if you did operate it in the previous year, a short-term rental, you have to attest that you operated it in accordance with all of the bylaws and regulations that pertain to STRs. Ah, okay. That's a very subtle nuance, but thank you. You're welcome. So, so John, if I may ask a clarifying question that rose in my mind, um, the protected status is, is not abdicated if one does not get a license or operate as a short-term rental. It is for at any point in time while the, the ownership is the same, correct? You could do it for a few years and then not do it for a few years and then come back, but you would not be required to have a license every year to retain the protected status. That's correct. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. So hopefully that makes sense to people. You don't have to get a license to retain your protected status. But if you do operate, you have to have operated within all the rules to retain your protected status. Correct. Okay, great. Any other questions from the audience on Article 1? Seeing none, we can move to the, there you go, Erica, that's good. Jim? Okay, thanks, Brooke. So on to Article 2, the shorter section. Um, what does primary zoning mean? And that's, that's what is being recommended in Article 2. Primary zoning means that the use is a legal primary use. Article 2 would establish STRs as a primary use, but only if the STR obeys all the regulations set forth in Article 1 that we just heard about. Now, here's a key point. What voting total in percent or in fractions does a zoning bylaw need to pass? It needs a supermajority. It needs two thirds, which is a much higher bar than 50%, of course. So that's something to consider. And then finally, if, if the zoning bylaw is passed, does that mean that untrammeled or unfettered STRs will be allowed in every corner of the island? I've been reading in some letters that it does, and we really don't believe it does. So the answer we would give to that is no. Only STRs that obey all the regulations set forth in Article 1 will be allowed. Okay, now, um, I think you might look upon the fact in Article 1 that there's a few overlapping protections. For instance, let's talk about the um, investor-only STR that we want to discourage. For one thing, the new properties such a person might buy would only be allowed for contracts or changes of occupancy in high season. Also, that person would only be allowed to purchase one STR. So they even so they wouldn't it wouldn't be one person buying at five or ten and setting up a huge complex of STRs. Anyway, that is the information on the zoning bylaw. And we do want to go back to some questions on the warrant, but I think before that. Brooke, maybe there will be questions on Article 2. Yep. Uh, open to the audience. Any questions on Article 2? And do ask. Um, good evening, and do as um, on Mill Street. Um, the question I have is actually relating to both. And that is if we could have an explanation of the difference between the Finance Committee recommended warrant and the Select Board recommended warrant and um, what uh, may be possible in, in terms of the process on town floor given two conflicting okay. warrants. We and I'm gonna hold your question, I'm gonna hold your question and and um, because that's a process question and, and we'll move into that. I realized last time, last week when we did this, we started with the process questions and then went into the meat of the articles. So I will, if you could just hold that for a second and um, I wanna ask, take direct questions about the content of article two first, and then we'll talk about the connection between them and town, and town meeting process. Thanks, Dan. Um, Campbell, hand is up again. Yes, um, thank you. So I know Article 2 is quite short, and I don't have a problem with uh, understanding the number one of Article 2. I just, um, I'd like to know what is the rationale for every district, including the CTEC, which is not 
a residential only district. Um, I believe it's a commercial trade, um, entrepreneurial and craft zone. And so I'm sort of wondering, I noticed that it wasn't NCI, but so I just like to understand why it was yes across the board, if that is applicable, because like I said, I sometimes I think just checking, yes, everything. But if you think about the districts and what their intent is and how they're used and how they're needed, um, I, I had a hard time figuring out how everything was applicable. Is that a question you could possibly? Yeah. I understand your um, question, Campbell. Um, I think, uh, John, if you could, I'm gonna take a stab at this and then I'm gonna let John um, and Jim weigh in. My understanding is that where residential occupancy is allowed is where the work group um, decided to uh, put this in zoning as permissible. And CTEC is a sort of a co combined zoning district that has both the opportunity for residential use and um, business use. So it's a shared use. And so because residential occupancy is allowed in CTEC, it was included in this. And I think that's sort of the short answer that there were no areas where residential occupancy is permitted that were excluded from. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna guess, Jim, this is because there may well be uh, people who have um, created residential units in CTEC who have, sh have short-term rented in the past and under the theory of protecting um, people who've made investments in property to date is the idea. Yeah, exactly. Um, does that sound right, Jim? Okay. Um, Campbell, I hope that answers your question. Well, I, um, I, don't, I don't think it does very well because it's not, you know, CTEC really isn't meant to be residential. The residential so, is meant to be tied so, to the business. So Campbell. So I'm, I'm getting there. Campbell. Okay. Uh, you're going to yeah. cut me off. I already know you are, Brooke. I'm just going yeah. about my confusion on why it's included because I feel that it's quite, it, it unnecessarily creates uh, rival competitions within the, Campbell, these districts. Campbell. So I'm, I'm going to be quiet now, Campbell. Brooke. Yeah, yeah. Just just for the audience, I, I, I'm trying very hard just to, to hold the boundary between um, what, what would be a discussion for town meeting um, rather, rather than um, the, the impact of the articles as written, um, less about whether how they were written was appropriate in one direction or another. Um, so trying to, trying to thread that needle, um, Campbell, I hope you understand. Um, any other questions specifically about article two as it's written? Uh, the Vidonis, the Vidonis? Their, yeah, yeah, I was going to say they had their hand raised earlier. Yep, I see it now. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, and thanks for doing this. I think it's wonderful that you're taking a lot of time to do these workshops or these um, information sessions. So um, just a brief comment. Um, We've been on the island since 99. We we refer to our home as our family home. We're there four to five months throughout the entire year. Virgin, Virginia, I'm going to interrupt you for the same reason. Uh, yes. Can you, rather yes, than I, narrative, please, if yes. you have a question, ask a question. Thanks so much. I do. I do. There has been conversations and um, among people who question why um, houses or why corporate owners are being allowed to continue. And um, I think the issue of property rights is an important one to explain um, that you can't, well, anyway, but can someone comment on that, on how, how property rights are also an issue in, um, in zoning, or excuse me, in this bylaw? 
or in the zoning bylaw. So I think. Uh, Did I thank make you? And I, it, I, I'm going to I'm going to try to reinterpret your question, and I think Jim spoke to it a little bit early about why, when when the group protected existing short-term rentals, they didn't exclude corporate ownership owner. Owners yeah. from those protections and John, is that your question? Yes, yes. Okay, great. John, do you can you answer that? I think you know that um, in terms why why the protection had to be extended to all owners if it was extended to some owners. Well, um, it, that's a very complicated question. Let let me start by saying, um, you know, under zoning there's a line of cases that say you cannot regulate uh, in zoning based upon the ownership of the property. Um, so we would not, uh, we advise not to attempt to put anything in the zoning bylaw that would uh, have a different set of regulations for corporations as opposed to individuals. Um, the, the, there are some concerns with treating now, so that's that's zoning. Now, when you get back to general bylaw, which is Article One, there are certain concerns that if you treat corporations and LLCs and S corps, et cetera, differently than individuals, that, that you could raise some constitutional issues um, as to why they are being treated differently than other entities. And while I'm not here to suggest that um, a legal challenge on that basis would be successful. I think uh, pursuant to discussions with the work group, it was felt that um, providing protection to all classes of owners under the general bylaw, which includes corporations, um, would be the best course of action going forward. The other thing, Brooke, and it's not exactly an answer to the question, but when, when you look at Article 1, that's a general bylaw, you are regulating the operation of short-term rentals. You're not operating the use. Conversely, in Article 2, you only regulate uses through zoning. And so that is a use regulation in Article 2. But it's very important to understand that you only get that primary use pr protection if you are operating your short-term rental in, a, in compliance with the Article I regulations. So we generally were concerned about, um, about um, singling out corporations from other classes of owners, certainly in the zoning bylaw, but there is some concern in the general bylaw as well. Thanks, John. Um, does that? Okay, great. Um, Erica, if we could, there we go, great. Um, so if there aren't any more questions uh, specific to Article 2, John, I'm going to ask you to go back and do what we did last week, which is to walk the audience through town meeting process. What happens when we all gather on uh, November 7th? Um, for, for those who haven't um, been to a town meeting or this is their, they're new or this is their first engagement in town meeting process, helpful just where we start and how these get um, okay. um, addressed. Certainly. So we all know that the warrant is the legal document that the select board prepares, which lists all of the warrant articles. It notifies the, notifies the voters when, when and where to meet. Um, and, and the actions that are going to be the subject of the town meeting, that's the, uh, that's the warrant. That's already been pu published and posted by the select board. Then in Nantucket, when you get to town meeting, you don't vote on the warrant article itself. You vote on a main motion that is presented by the finance committee in most instances, zoning their, their proposed by the planning board.
but the finance committee generally makes a main motion on all warrant articles. Um, and in, in this instance, the planning board, excuse me, the finance committee made a few changes to what's printed in the warrant. Um, they, they relate to the linkage of the articles. And very briefly, um, the warrant says that Article One stands alone. If it passes, it passes. It's not dependent on the passage of Article Two. Whereas the Finance Committee motion says that in order for Article One to go into effect, it must also be uh, uh, Article Two must also pass. So that's the first difference. Um, the second difference is with respect to the protections afforded to uh, existing STR operations. Uh, and uh, essentially, the warrant provided that uh, you would have protected status if sometime pro um, since uh, 2019, you operated your unit as a short-term rental, you registered with the state, and you paid the, uh, the uh, rooms tax that's applicable in at least one third calendar quarter. Um, the Finance Committee made a different mo uh, approach in their motion, which basically says if you have a if it's an existing building and you have a certificate of occupancy issued by the building commissioner, then you are protected. So that is a more generous protection contained in the Finance Committee motion than what was contained in the warrant. Now, um, so let's fast forward to November 7th. This article is called, and the Finance Committee motion is the one that's on the floor. Um, and that will be debated, and it is susceptible to an amendment. Any registered voter could stand up and move to amend the Finance Committee motion by substituting the language that's contained in Article 1 in the warrant. That requires a major majority vote. Um, I believe that the moderator would likely find that all we're doing in that motion to amend is going back to the original language that the voters were warned of. Um, that amendment will be debated. It will be voted on. If it passes by a majority vote, we then go on to discuss the rest of Article 1, and then there'll be a motion to uh, basically adopt Article 1 as amended, and that's a majority vote as well. And, and that assumes that someone offers an amendment. Otherwise, we would be um, voting on, voting the, on fin the finance committee motion. Finance committee motion, right? Correct. So, yep. Uh, so, are there any questions as to? the process of um, and do us. Sorry, thank you, John, for that further explanation. Um, but to be perfectly clear, if we're on the floor and a motion is made to consider the select board article the article as approved by the select board rather than the article as approved by the finance committee, um, that motion is put onto the floor and it passes. That means the entirety of article one reverts to the select board um, approved warrant uh, article rather than any particular provision, correct? Yes, if the motion is made and to substitute what's in the printed warrant from what's in the finance committee motion, then we would revert back to the warrant language. And that does not link article one to the passage of article two. And it has the more, what I will call the more generous uh, protection. Uh, that, but that's not to say, Anne, that somebody couldn't also make a motion just to restore the linkage or a motion just to change the protection paragraph. Those are two separate things and a motion, for example, 
um, to amend the finance committee motion by adding back in the linkage language only, that would be debated. And if it's approved, then the main motion is amended by that amendment and we would proceed to debate and then vote on it. Okay, so in other words, you could um, ask to go back to the entirety uh, to the uh, to the select board warrant language article language in its entirety or um, uh, address a different a specific element of the part that has been changed. And that's only two sections, the introductory paragraph with the linkage language and subparagraph H. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Campbell Sutton. All right. Um, good evening again. Um, so that just brought up a question. When you're amend, in my small understanding, if you are trying to amend the article, you can only make it less restrictive, not more restrictive. Does that also apply to the FinCom amendments or um, when you're discussing an amendment to the amendment, if that makes sense? Well, Campbell, first of all, and, and I discussed this last week, I, I think it's a mistake to just adopt the um, understanding that an amendment cannot be more restrictive. Um, it really is a question whether the voters were adequately wa warned through the warrant of the nature of the amendment that would be considered at town meeting. Um, so the finance committee's motion is different than what was printed in the warrant. Correct. And I, um, I have reason to believe because I've had a discussion with the town moderator, but of course her rulings are always subject to, you know, an analysis of the exact amendment on the floor. But I believe the moderator is likely of the opinion that a motion to amend to go back to what's printed in the warrant would be within the scope. Okay. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. The the she's likely to rule that the finance committee main motion, which differs from the warrant article, would be within the scope, and she would allow that amendment to be voted on. That I'm sorry, the main motion to be voted on. Now, if someone makes a motion to amend the finance committee motion by, for example, going back to the wording in the warrant, that's clearly within the scope because you would just go be going back to the document that was published in the warrant. Okay, thank you for clearing that up, John. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you guys taking the time to do this. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions at this point about AJ Heath? AJ, if you are still muted, you need to unmute yourself. Um. My question is, we've never operated this property as a short-term rental. Um, in the future, who knows? Um, maybe it will need to be operated as a short-term rental uh, to meet expenses. Does that mean people in our position should be rushing to register? Well, um, if I can... Sorry, go ahead, John. Go I'm ahead, sorry. John. So uh, AJ, um, it depends upon whether the finance committee motion passes or we go back to the original wording in the warrant. If the finance committee motion passes, then you, as long as you have a certificate of occupancy for the unit as of November 7th, then you can engage in, in you, your unit will be protected. Um, if you go back, if we go back to the wording in the warrant because you haven't 
rented the property as a short-term rental, then you wouldn't have the protected status, but you would still be able to rent it um, for four changes in occupancy. Have I stated that correctly, Jim? Yes, that is absolutely correct. Yes. So to be clear, the regulations do not prohibit any, any individual who owns a single property from short-term renting. Either way that this passes, it's the number of contracts that you are permitted to engage in in the months of July and August. That's the distinction. So, sure. um, so it's it's it, the, what is protected, AJ, um, or not protected, depending on which direction this goes, is the ability to rent nine turnovers in July and August, or nine contracts versus four. And, and if I might add, this may not matter, but it almost seems like ancient history now. But the short-term rental group's original version was in agreement with what the FinCom just set up, which was the more expansive definition of what would be protected. That is, as John said, any property with a CO before November 7th. Is that? I, I, that, that, that's, uh, that's what I understood from what you had said, but it still speaks to because of the timing of the town meeting and when you have to register, you sort of have to make a decision about whether you want to you know, race race to do that, even though you have no use for it at the moment, because you're so, thinking AJ, of the future. <laughs> AJ, if I might, it, it really doesn't depend on, there's no race to register here, okay? Um, you know, the town's registration um, system isn't even up and running and won't be by November 7th. So that's not relevant. You don't have to, you, you don't have to rush to register. And by the way, there is no registration process. The issue is if you've never rented your property before as a short-term rental, but the finance committee motion passes, you've had a certificate of, and you've had a certificate of occupancy for that unit on the date of town meeting, then you you have the nine rental contract protection. If the fight, if the select board's version passes, then you will not meet the requirements for the protected status because you have never used it as a short-term rental in the past. That's correct. Okay, thank you. However, you would be allowed you would be allowed to do four contracts in July and August and an unlimited number of contracts the rest of the year. Oh yes, absolutely. Right. Okay. Hopefully that helps. That well, it it does it clarifies it. Um, yep, for sure. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Penny Hurley. Yes, it's Penny and Mike, and we're here listening. Thank you all for all this work. What a tough thing to present to everyone. Uh, John, the question I have is, what's the difference between protected and grandfathering in your recent discussions? Nothing. Protected is just a, um, uh, a protect. <laughs> may, may I try? A protected is a is a is a term that is replaced grandfathered because of the historic, um, the, the negative historic uh, associations with the word grandfather. It's just a it's just a word choice that is respectful of the history associated with the term grandfathering. They mean the same. They mean that they intend to mean the same thing, right, John? Yeah, and just yes, and just so that you know the the uh, objection to the use of the term grandfathering was contained in a footnote by, in a decision in the appeals court by one justice who indicated in the future, he would not use that term, but he would use the term protected. So that's okay, where- Okay, we, 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 we follow you, but just to make sure that we're uh, understanding this correctly, that if 
We have more than one dwelling on an existing property. Three acre. A, a three acre property. Uh, we can continue to rent those two dwellings under two different registrations as, a, as long as we're protected. Yes. And we're protected in, in the finance committee uh, uh, motion if we have a, C, a COA, which we do on each of the dwellings. And if it gets put back to the uh, uh, the original warrant language uh, approved board. by the select board, we're protected if we had rented each of those dwellings in one of the three or four quarters, third quarters of 2019 to 2023. That's, that's correct. correct. Is that yeah. a true statement? That's, that's, that's good clarification. Thank you so much. And thank you again for what you're doing. Sure. Um, AJ, I'm going to um, take Beth Lloyd Thomas because it's her first time with her hand up, and then we'll take a follow up from you. Hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you all for all the work that you're doing. We really appreciate it. Question, um, where we live, we are uh, residents of Nantucket, um, but uh, we live with my mom and she is not a resident of Nantucket, but the short-term rentals, that, like the, the couple of the, the two that we sometimes rent out are in her name. Does that matter? Do you have to be a Nantucket resident? No. There's okay. No There's... There's no residency requirement in either of these either article one or two. Okay, great. You may have made that clear and maybe I missed it. So thank you for that. Thank you. AJ, a follow-up? I think that you you answered the quest the question. I guess the problem with it is not knowing which version may pass at town meeting. And of course, you don't know the answer to that, <laughs> so, nor, nor does anyone else. Well, welcome to our fascinating <laughs> governance structure here on Nantucket. Exactly. Um, I don't, uh, Brooke, I, I'm not in the business of telling people how to vote. That's really not my role. But I do think that um, in the particular circumstance here, um, a person who had that concern would probably want to support the finance committee motion rather than reverting back to the select board version. Well, well, I would, I would agree with you, but we don't have, you know, you, you don't know how everyone else is going to vote. So no, you don't, no, you don't. <laughs> that, that, that is true. Um, uh, Denise, chime in. And one could offer it may not pass at all. So there's also that option. <laughs> Thank uh, you for that re reminder. Something else, Denise? Yeah, and just John, the clarification on the registration, it's um, in the select board vocab or wording, it was sub submits proof of state registration to the Board of Health, not the town registration. So that was the registration it was referring to. So thank you. Right. <laughs> there, yes, there are two components to, the, to that version. That, that the property has been registered with the state and proof that the that taxes, the short-term rental tax has been paid for that property. You can't pay the tax without registering the property. So um, those two go hand in hand. So if you have rented, collected the short-term rental tax and paid it for the period inclusive of July and August, any of the last five years through 2023, that would qualify you for the protection under the original select board version of th the protection clause. Right. So hopefully that's a little clearer. Yep. Um, I don't know if you have other hands up, but there were two questions sent into us and I was wondering if I could read one and, and ask John to answer maybe one or both of them. Yes, I'm going to ask AJ, if you don't have a follow up question, could you take your hand down because you um, I keep thinking you have more questions. Thank you. Okay. okay. Oh, you do have another question, but I'm, I'm going to have Jim go ahead with the questions that were submitted and then AJ will. 
Okay. It's down now. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Um, this one, I believe John answered this last week, but I'm sure people want to hear it again. John, this is the question that, that you've seen. It says, um, if Article 2 does not pass, will the town of Nantucket be liable for legal fees associated with legal challenges to the town's approval of certain STRs by neighbors of those STRs? Thank you, Jim. The, uh, in my opinion, there would be no liability to the town. And that's because town meeting is the legislative body of the town. And there is a, um, a, a doctrine, a legal doctrine known as legislative immunity. Um, and there's also protections under the Tort Claims Act. Uh, if just imagine if the town were liable for every decision it makes at town meeting when, when it amends a bylaw, just, and I don't mean to diminish this, but just because someone incurs legal fees in defending a lawsuit. Um, so the answer that, to that question is I'm quite confident, no, the town is not gonna incur liability. Great. Okay. And and was, there, was there one more, Jim, please? Yes, this is, uh, it's a series of questions, but I think I'll for, try to condense it to one from Carter Cool, my former student, hi Carter. Um, and it's a question about LLCs and I think whether they can be protected, John. It says, um, I'm seeking clarity on how the article would apply to situations where natural persons own multiple LLCs when each LLC owns a home on Nantucket. Based on my reading of the article, it is not clear whether those LLCs could each short-term rent their homes. And for instance, he has a scenario, if uh, two LLCs are both owned by the same four natural persons who all have a 25% ownership stake, um, both LLCs own a home on Nantucket and attempt to register to short-term rent under this new article. Is this allowed? And I think, John, this is going getting to the question of LLCs that do have natural persons and therefore qualify for protection. Um, can they uh, operate more than one, I believe, is the is this key to that yes. question. Yeah, and they would be different LLCs, so they're different legal entities. But if, if the um, all of the... Um, um, members of the LLC are natural persons. And if they are the same people, I would say that uh, in that circumstance, that would be an attempt to evade the regulations. Um, and I would also point out that there is a provision um, in subparagraph, um, I want to, is it F? Excuse me one second. Um, Oh, yes, the um, it, on the issue of, um, you know, restrictions, um, the restriction on only one um, uh, In, uh, LLC per owner and the natural persons provision under the LLC. Um, we, we added a, par a sentence that says the Board of Health may adopt regulations pursuant to 123-4, establishing the documentation required to establish eligibility under this section. So my recommendation when we, you know, if this all passes, would be to include a question on the application form. If you are an LLC, do the, do the natural, you have to identify the natural persons. And we would ask, do those same natural persons, oh, um, uh, are they also members of a second LLC that is applying for a certificate of registration? And I think we could um, fashion regulations by the Board of Health that would prohibit that from occurring. And would that um, prohibit it unless they were protected? Is that correct? In other words, if they were protected, could they still? Yes, be, be, yes, because if, yes. if, if, if no, well, if you're protected, yeah, um, there's no limitation, right? Um, yeah, on the so number, of, on the the number of rentals. If if they're not protected, then it would become much more relevant, obviously. I understand. Thank you. That's it, Brooke, for the questions I had. Okay. Um, any further questions from our audience? Okay, some hands going up. Ann Duas? Hi, I'd like to go back to Article 1 just for a second, um, if we could, please. And um, I know this came up last week in terms of talking about uh, budget 
for the um, the creation of the registration, the operation of the system, and the enforcement of the regulations. Um, and one um, person talked about the fees that will potentially accrue to the town from short-term rental registration. Um, but my question is, if those fees, which I understand will go into a revolving account and be available only for this purpose, um, are insufficient to run the program and enforce it, um, is there any budget expected um, to be identified? Um, how will that be, how will that how will that money question, which is critical, um, be addressed? John. So the the revolving fund uh, is established by bylaw, and and if the um, uh, if it turns out that the fees collected are not robust enough, are not sufficient to maintain a robust enforcement, we would go back to, uh, we would increase the spending limit on the revolving fund. And the, the um, select board and the board of health by regulation could potentially increase the fee if that were to occur. So the intention is that the fees would cover costs associated with the registration process and enforcement. I see, so, thank I see you. the town manager has come on, but I, just, I mean, that is the intent. That was one of the considerations when the fee was has already been established. Great, John. Uh, Brooke, if I might just add to that, um, I was just going to mention that, uh, of course, we don't have any fees right now. So there will need to be an initial funding of the vendor for the registration program, and we have a funding source for that. Okay. Thanks, Libby. Uh, Paula McLeod? Hi there, um, and I apologize for not being um, completely prepared with this question, but I'm a co-owner in a property that is not held in an LLC, but instead was put into a limited partnership, which is the kind of thing you do with an oil and gas company and has, has one general partner and limited partners. Does, any, does anyone have a similar legal situation and know whether or not that sounds like it falls into the same categories as an LLC? John? Is it, is it an S corporation? I don't believe it is an S corporation. Well, it's, a, it's a limited partnership. So I think um, I, I, technically it, this only applies to an LLC, a trust, or an S corporation. Um, but I would point out that um, you know there is a provision in this bylaw for a hardship exemption, um, and it sounds to me like you might be able to make a case that. Um, this particular form of ownership that you're speaking about is the equivalent of an S corporation. I, I'm, I can't give you legal advice, obviously, but um, that was not something we addressed in the bylaw. Uh, so, understand. Thank you, Paula. Before you go, may I ask: Are you are you doing short term rentals already? No. Okay. But it's a family property, and so I am concerned about as it passes to other generations that they be able to to uh, keep it financially viable. Now, yes, I, it's it is a very interesting question because if that is deemed to be a corporate ownership, it would not be permitted. But if it's not a corporate ownership, yeah. So it's a it's a We'll see. Obviously, John said <laughs> it hasn't been addressed yet. And and by the way, um, a general bylaw, such as proposed in Article One, and John, you can you can correct me if I'm miswording this, has the capacity to be amended um, 
to accommodate situations that come up that were not considered in the original drafting. So uh, one of the one of the um, reasons for doing this in a general bylaw in some ways is that it is changeable as we learn more about the use and application of the bylaw if a ver if this version passes. So um, that I just wanted to make that comment. So thanks, Paula. Thank you. Um, I know it's a tough. Uh, it's been a tough road. Thank you. Yeah, there are a lot of unique circumstances within um, the short-term rental market, as it were, um, many, many unique circumstances. And so an amendable bylaw will allow us to um, adapt over time. Any other um, questions from the audience? Nothing like I'm gonna bring the meeting to a close to motivate people to raise their hands. Um, and I do wanna remind people that the FAQs are available on um, the town website, on the short-term uh, rental work group page and the special town meeting page. There are links to drive to the, the written FAQs. And also this video will be uploaded uh, immediately upon completion of this meeting to the town's YouTube channel so you can share it with your friends. We would love to have people learn as much as possible before November 7th um, about um, the things that we've elaborated on in the, these last two meetings um, and having the voters come as well prepared as possible is part of the goal of this and also to give folks an opportunity to query about their individual situations. So last chance before we call this meeting to a close, Thank you all for coming. Thank you to the panelists for being here again this evening, uh, to John and Jim, and um, off we go. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Brooke. Thanks, Charles. You got it.